Welcome to your content lecture on insular art. This is a period that historians used to call the Dark Ages because these were the people that destroyed Rome and so they must have been barbarians and their art was crude and primitive because it didn't look Roman. Um, this is problematic because it's so derogatory. Um, actually this period, I, it's one of my favorites because I find the art to be really interesting. Um, the term insular refers to the fact that it comes primarily from the British islands. It's a little bit problematic because it sounds like they're cut off from the rest of Europe when there was actually a lot of influence from surrounding areas. Um, the years are generally 550 to 800 and the art's primarily Christian, although the notable exception to this is the burial site at Sutton Hoo, and that's what we're starting with. So here's our map. We're going to be looking at works discovered buried in a boat at Sutton Hoo. So here is an impression of the ship that was uncovered in Sutton Hoo. And what they found in there was a treasure trove of all sorts of different things. Jewelry, weapons, plates, coins, you name it. Basically, this really successful, wealthy person was buried here in a ship around 625 AD and it never was robbed and in the first half of the 20th century they excavated it and found all of these remarkable things completely intact. Um, now if you're somebody who likes British literature you might have read Beowulf and you know in Beowulf they send their, uh, their leaders off to burn in a boat and this is interesting because they buried this guy in a boat and it shows that there's a lot of similarities between what was in that epic poem and perhaps how they actually practiced. So some of the things that they discovered here, they were primarily small pieces of decorative art, so bu belt buckles, shoulder clasps, and I'm starting with these because they establish a lot of the stylistic strategies, namely they use interlace, these are ornamental interwoven lines, zoomorphic forms, so there's animals incorporated into here. A lot of them use um, milfiore, which is a blue checkered glass. So the red and the blue in here, this is glass, it's not, not jewels. Looking closely at this hinged clasp, uh, you can find the animals. They're, it's a little hard at first, but it's kind of fun. If you look in here, these are snakes. And then these are two pigs that you see in, in profile. So here's um, the tail and then the ridge. And this is going down to the, the snout of one. And then here's the other one's snout. So that's how it, that's how it works. And just one more view, there's two of these. And they basically, they went on your shoulders and they kind of held the two leather halves of your shirt together. What's interesting about these is you see this same style filtering into the Christian art that we're primarily focusing upon. Okay, so what we're looking at here is from the Gospel Book of Duro. It's one of the earliest manuscripts that survives and in a Gospel Book they only have the four Gospels, so only the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and there are some stylistic strategies and organizational strategies that they pursue in these books. So the beginning of a gospel usually starts with a symbol of the writer. And for Matthew, his symbol is a man because the book of Matthew starts with the lineage of Christ. And so here we've got a man, um, although he doesn't really look very naturalistic, right? He kind of looks like he's got these weird legs sticking out of here. And then this I put it here next to the belt clasp, or the, the shoulder clasp, rather, because you can see that it's designed almost the same way that these metal things are. And so again, you can look at this and call it syncretism. It's very similar to what we saw in the early Christian period, where they take the same stylistic strategies, but they transform the meaning. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the history of the book because we're going to be looking at a lot of illuminated manuscripts over the rest of the semester. So we used to have rolls of parchment um, or papyrus, but moving into the Christian period, you have the invention of the codex or a book. Um, and this is really good for the Christian practice because they're far more portable, um, as you can imagine, than uh, the delicate papyrus scroll would be. 
Um, they also make it easy to cross-reference. The Gospel are four different accounts of the life of Christ that you're kind of supposed to read simultaneously. It's very easy to move between different chapters in a book. It is less easy to do so in a, a papyrus roll. However, these books are really expensive to make. One of these books will k you need to kill 300 calves to produce enough vellum for these books. And what you do with the vellum, basically you skin the calf, you put it in lye so that it degrades and gets thinner, and then you stretch it out, and then you scrape it until it gets to the des desired thickness. And then you might repeat it again if you can't get it thin enough. Then you take the parchment that you've just created and you nest it, or and then if you want to be even more frugal, you fold it again so you get more pages out of it. And then you give it to the monks, whose job it is to recopy books into this new, new thing. And the way they make it so even is you can see that they have this star wheel that they will use to go down this one side. Um, and then they use uh, the rulings to make sure everything is even. So these monks, their entire job as scribes was recopying books. And this is a picture of what it might have been like to be a scribe doing this. They probably, there were certain scribes who only did the writing, as we see here, and then others whose job it was to do the illuminations or the illustrations. Um, but these are called illuminations, that's just the term for them. And then some of the words that we use to describe these pages come from um, the practice of books. So verso and recto, the verso is the left side of the page, the recto is the right side of the page, and that's where those words come from. We talked about that back with the palette of armor. Okay, so most of the time these Bibles are gospel books because you can imagine even when they're super thin that vellum is still pretty thick. Um, however, there is such a thing called a pandect. A pandect is a complete Bible. And what we're looking at here is an illustration that um, that is the beginning of such a, a book. So this is Ezra restoring the Bible. What's interesting about this is it was made in the in England, but then was sent to Italy. You can see now it's in the Biblioteca Medicea in uh, the, the Laurentian Library in Florence, um, but it was actually made in England and sent there because a lot of these monasteries will have relationships with um, uh, other continental monasteries. So. I, I want to look at this because you can see a lot of iconographic um, elements that we will continue to shape. Right here, we have the Old Testament figure Ezra, who is rewriting the Hebrew Bible. In the book of Ezra, it describes how they had lost the Hebrew Bible during the Babylonian captivity, but he just happened to have it memorized, so he wrote it out again. This is a different gospel book um, that features a very similar composition, right? So here, this is the Lindisfarne Gospels. Uh, this is in the United Kingdom. It never left. And you can see that you've got Matthew here writing his book. Um, it's very, very similar to the way that they painted Ezra. And these are very close in, in time period. They're both from the 8th century. Like, and these monasteries are pretty close to each other. But if you look at these stylistically, they're so different, right? The St. Matthew is all about lines. Um, you've got some of the interlaced type shapes that we recognize from Sutton Hill, um, whereas this one is all about color. And one theory is that because they knew they were going to be sending this to Italy, they chose a style that they thought would appeal to the Italians. Whereas this one that's staying in the UK, they choose a style that appeals to these English monks who are going to be using the text. This is another element of gospel books that I think is particularly fantastic. Um, this is what's called a carpet page. Um, so it's called that because it looks like a, a textile. Um, these are remarkable. If you look closely at this, you can see all of the different intertwining lines in here. They are perfectly constructed. Um, the amount of planning that went into producing this and then actually making it is remarkable. I mean, and these have little animals in them too. Here's a detail um, where you can see the, and now that you've seen the detail, you might be able to pick out the little heads throughout. 
And it's amazing, I think, because it looks like these swirling snakes inscribed by the thick lines of the cross. So every gospel book uh, would start with an image of the gospel writer and then um, this carpet page. The carpet page I want to spend the most time on, though, is this guy, because he is just phenomenal. So this is from the Book of Kells, and it's now in Ireland. Um, and I want you to take time to go onto the website from the Trinity College Library, where it is in Dublin, and really zoom in on the different parts, because it, I, I promise it is so satisfying. Um, to see all of the ways that they constructed this with the interlacing lines, all of the different animals that you find throughout here. Um, but the thing to keep in mind about these is, well, it's twofold. One, these gospel books are so phenomenally expensive and precious. This one was actually made in Scotland, and when the monks that produced this were raided by the Vikings, they carried it with them and when they went to Ireland. So this thing has traveled all over the place um, because it was so precious. The people who used this, it wasn't like your average monk would go into the library and like, oh, I think I'll look at the gospel in here. No, this was the thing that was used on the altar during the mass and they would read from the gospel book in here. So it's incredibly precious, incredibly special, um, just in terms of the ink that goes into it. Some of this ink uses pigment from Afghanistan. Um, Afghanistan, right? Like, how do they even get that to England or Scotland where this was made? Um, and it's it's just remarkable in terms of the two-dimensional design even. Um, but for these monks, I mean, yes, they probably love the luxury of it. But part of this, part of what made this so special to them was their devotion to the text. Because for them, this wasn't these weren't just words, it was divine. These are words spoken by God. Um, in this is the same book, the Book of Kells, and this is the introduction to the Gospel of John, which begins with, with this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So for them, this Word that they're copying is literally divine. And so it makes sense to make it beautiful and ornate and use the most precious things that you have. Anyway, that's, that's our short content lecture on insular art. Thank you.